Peter is way, way too kind. Thank you very much, and thank you all very much for being here. The other evening, we were uh, coming out of Washington. It was a beautiful, clear evening, and the uh, lights in all of those buildings were on and reflecting across the uh, Potomac. And I was thinking about this uh, subject as we drove out. Those lights were on, of course, because of electricity. I watched the airplanes coming down the Potomac, one about every minute to land at the airport. And the runway lights were on because of electricity, and the air traffic control center was functioning because of electricity, or they wouldn't be able to land. And one of those buildings was a uh, couple going to dinner. They had stopped at the ATM machine to get some money. Uh, that wouldn't work without electricity. And they had uh, direct deposit of their paycheck in the bank, and that, of course, that whole system wouldn't work without electricity. They took the elevator to the uh, restaurant floor, and of course, uh, that was powered with electricity. They ordered their meal, and the food was brought to the, uh, uh, to the uh, hotel by uh, a truck, and it was electricity that powered the pumps that put the diesel in the truck. It was also electricity in a large number of ways that was uh, uh, important in the production of the food that they were to eat. They uh, had to go to the restroom during the meal, and it was electricity that uh, powered the pumps that brought the water to uh, flush the toilet. And it was electricity that was uh, powering the sewage treatment plant to treat the, uh, the sewage. When I thought of all of the contributions that electricity was making to our life, there are about 17 infrastructures out there, important infrastructures, and none of them work without electricity. Without, without electricity, everything stops. And there are several things that could, uh, could disrupt the grid, perhaps for long periods of time. One of those I think is unlikely, and that is a pandemic where everybody is so sick that they just can't get there to keep the system working. Let's hope that doesn't happen. Uh, Dr. Pry has uh, mentioned two of the uh, threats to the grid. One of them is a uh, maybe, and that is an EMP attack. The other is an absolute certainty. That's a when, that's not an if, and that's a giant solar storm. The 1859 storm uh, described by Dr. Carrington from England called a Carrington event that will occur again. And when it does, if we have not prepared, the grid will be down, and it will be down for a long period of time. There was a storm not quite so large in 1921. When we have another one of those, the grid will also go down. So this is a... Uh, uh, this is a when, this is not an if. There are two other things that could bring the grid down. One is a, a, a terrorist attack. And I'm told that there are, what, 11 critical substations. So 11 people armed with nothing more than a 22, and the knowledge of which uh, insulators to take out could bring down uh, the grid. Uh, the fifth thing that could bring down the grid, of course, and there have been a plethora of articles on this. I get clips every day, and it, 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 Day does not go by. There's not a clip in there mentioning the vulnerability of our grid to a cyber attack. Now, how do these things bring the grid down for such a prolonged period of time? It would seem that after disruption, you just uh, turn the switches and it would start again. But it can't, because almost all of these would cause surges of electricity, which would blow the major transformers, and we don't make any of them. There are a few spares, nowhere near enough to replace the 100 or 200 that experts believe would be taken down in any of these uh, catastrophes. We don't make them. You have to order them. There are none on the shelf anywhere. They will build them when you order it, and it takes a year, a year and a half or so to build them. The uh, top security person in uh, FERC sat in my office and told me that the grid would be down for 18 years to two months after one of these attacks. And I said, gee, what would be the consequence? Of that? Oh, he said, two-thirds of the people in our country will die. That may be an underestimate. There have been a couple of books written on this subject. One I hope you've read is One Second After. Bill Fortune did a really good job of research of that. I think that that is pretty uh, true to what would happen. Another book, and I came to my office, and I've never met the author of this book, and uh, Dr. Lowry, and he was in his uh, hotel, I'm, I'm sorry, he was in the, the uh, hospital 
room uh, recovering from uh, heart surgery and he was surfing the television and he happened on C-SPAN and I was giving one of the probably half dozen hour long talks I've given on the floor of the Congress about EMP and he got turned on by this and he did a lot of research. He was a PhD in, in electrical engineering so it was right down his alley and he ended up writing a novel. I never thought I could read a 700 page novel but I read it and uh, wow, you know, uh, uh, one second after is bad enough. Uh, what Dr. Lowry uh, described in his book is just absolutely absolutely uh, uh, horrendous. Being so dependent on this infrastructure, it is quite remarkable that we have no fallback position. What would we do? What would we do if this, if this happened? Well, this is a, a fulfillment of a dream to see uh, this many people for this long to come apart to talk about this subject because it really, really is is critical to our, to our future. You know, I ran for Congress 20 years ago because um, I didn't have quite so many grandchildren then. I had 10 children. Now I have 18 grandchildren and two great-grandchildren. I was just concerned that they weren't going to have the chances that I had a really poor Depression-era kid to uh, work and achieve the first person in my direct family to go to college. Got a master's and a doctorate, was able to achieve in a number of, of different areas. I was concerned that... Uh, my kids and my grandkids weren't going to have that opportunity. And I'm concerned that uh, the basic fabric of the country might not even be for them, there for them if we haven't prepared. And this pre preparation is very difficult because unless everybody does it, nobody is going to do it. If one of the powder producers decides to do this to harden their part of the grid and so forth, it's, their product is going to cost them more money and they can't compete in a marketplace which is very competitive and so they're not going to do it unless everybody does it. I'm not a fan of big government, but I suspect this is one of the places where government needs to get involved or it's not going to happen. Thank you all very much for coming today. Do everything you can to push this ball forward. It's, I hope it's not too late. It could be but we can't turn back the hands of time. All we can do is the best that we can do from now on. Thank you very much for coming today.